Did corruption kill the South African miracle? In 1994, the people elected their first black president, former freedom fighter Nelson Mandela. In the years that followed, the world watched the Rainbow Nation as it moved away from apartheid, access to basic services was extended, institutions were reformed, and the crimes of the past came under scrutiny. The country also opened up to the world, hosting international events like the 1995 Rugby World Cup, the Earth Summit in 2002, or the FIFA World Cup in 2010. In recent years, however, South Africa has rather featured in global headlines because of corruption affairs and the downfall of state-owned companies, South African Airways, ESCOM or Denel. I'm Julien Trevian. We're looking at how corruption works and how it affects South Africans. My fellow South Africans. Take note of what is happening in South Africa. The date for the demise of the white minority regime has been determined. This is properly. It's over. It's a full rugby world cup for South Africa. With what we have gone through, we can't allow this, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, let me tell you something. The ANC is falling even further into the ground. You are not showing the comrades a way to eat. Shut up! Shut up! I want to share a pin drop. Put simply, corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. This includes gross financial misadministration, frauds, political interference in the recruitment of public sector staff, fraudulent representation by executive staff of their qualifications and procurement irregularities, including bribery. South Africa seems to check all the boxes, and that is not unusual. Democracy does not fix the issue of corruption. In fact, it often worsens in newly democratised countries. So, whilst the first years of democracy were some of great social development, Corrupt practices have had devastating effects on this progress. Economic growth has weakened, public services and the redistribution of wealth have become inefficient, and trust in institutions has eroded. Some economically and politically powerful have been led to play the game of corruption, encouraged by poor checks and balances. Over the years, public expenditure has turned to the most lucrative sectors, rather than social progress. I learned that the name is corruption, but the game is procurement, former ESCOM CEO Jabu Mabuza told the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture. Indeed, the wave of corruption that hit South Africa had to do with state contracts. There are many examples, but let's consider power producer ESCOM. The state-owned company has been at the centre of state capture for a decade or more. Several strategies were used to get money into the pockets of corrupt individuals, as described by former CEO André de Reuter in a book last year. The first step consisted in creating an environment that favoured such activities, restructuring the company to weaken it. The board and upper management would change, with competent officials replaced by compliant ones. Control mechanisms meant to avoid any illegitimate use of the company's finances were reduced, this allowed individuals to conspire to win lucrative procurement contracts. Coal, petrol, protective equipment and even power plants. Any expense could become dodgy. And that's exactly what happened. In 2007, ESCOM began building two coal fire plants as electricity demand was growing and all the plants were being decommissioned. Kusile and Medupi were to supply abundant and affordable power for decades to come. The contract was awarded to Japanese multinational Hitachi Power. Little did the public know, Hitachi Africa was linked to the ANC, and the ruling party won more than 5 million rands in dividends from the contract it had signed. This raised questions as to the legitimacy of this operation, especially after a near 10-year delay in the construction of both plants, which were scheduled to fully operate in 2014. The only accountability there was in this affair came from the US, where Hitachi was fined $19 million in 2015 for having engaged in corrupt activities. But South Africa only builds new plants so often, which has now become an issue. So, other resources are being preyed upon. For example, coal procurement contracts, with more than 80% of South Africa's electricity produced by coal fire plants, this resource arouses envy. 
entire networks at Escom have developed to award contracts to certain companies or individuals, bypassing calls for bids. Another strategy described by insiders is the partial unloading of call delivery trucks upon their arrival at power plants. Escom is therefore led to believe its consumption is higher than it really is, to order higher quantities of fuel than normally needed, and to pay suppliers more than it should have. Finally, there are acts of sabotage where malicious individuals or groups deliberately cause infrastructure to break down. This adds strain to the network and can potentially worsen power cuts. But most importantly, it forces ESCOM to call contractors to make repairs or deliver replacement parts and, once again, to pay more than it should have. It is difficult to tell how much of this is due to corruption, to maladministration or to other factors. One thing is clear, however, South Africans always end up paying the price. In 2023, government took over half of ESCOM debt in a move to put the utility back on track. From 2014 to 2019, South Africa has lost 1.5 trillion rands due to corruption. That's more than half of the country's annual state budget of about 2.2 trillion for 2023. That figure is probably not surprising to South Africans. Already in 2016, then public protector Tuli Matonsela had recognized alleged improper and unethical conduct by the president and other state functionaries resulting in improper and possibly corrupt award of state contracts whilst Jacob Zuma was in office. From the moment he became president in 2009, Jacob Zuma adopted a singular style of governance, taking decisions away from cabinet and nominating permissive ministers. He also reinforced political meddling into SOEs by appointing docile boards and executives and removing safeguard mechanisms. Since much media coverage and the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into state capture have shed light on the extent of corruption in SA. So why does it keep going? First, whistleblower protection is insufficient. Despite being one of the most effective ways to tackle corruption, many are still intimidated, threatened and sometimes killed for speaking out. Second, the police and justice systems are either complicit or powerless in the face of alleged perpetrators. Yet, it is acknowledged a high probability of being punished deters people from engaging in corrupt activities at all. Finally, South African elections do not work as a mechanism of sanction for corrupt politicians or organisations. Since 1994, competition to the ANC has been growing, but remains unable to unseat it on a national level. As a result, the party feels no imperative to have a sort out. This is what the second episode of this series will talk about. Is the ANC just a corrupt bunch? Why does the majority of South Africans still vote for it after so many scandals? And why has no other political party risen to national power in 30 years? This takes us to the end of this explainer. Thank you for watching. You can support Johannesburg Journal by subscribing and by liking, commenting and sharing this video. Until next time, salagatli!